What is subalternation? That question is answered and asked when we study the traditional or Aristotelian square of opposition. Now, I'm going to assume that you are already familiar with a categorical proposition. More specifically, I'm going to assume that you are familiar with the categorical proposition types, namely the two quantities, universal and particular, and the two quantities, affirmative and negative. Combining those, we have four proposition types in categorical logic, universal affirmative, universal negative, particular affirmative, and particular negative. I'm also going to assume that you are familiar with Venn diagrams and the shorthand for categorical propositions. First, let's remind ourselves that when we study the traditional or Aristotelian square of opposition, we operate under the assumption of existential import. In other words, we operate under the assumption that at least one member of the subject class in a universal claim is assumed to exist. Now, we don't need to make this assumption for a particular claim because a particular claim just makes an existential assertion. A particular claim says there is some term or there is some thing S, there is some class that has at least one S member, and that S member is a member also of the P class or it is not. So when we assume existential import, a number of valid immediate inferences result. We begin with sub and super alternation. First, as a reminder, the universal proposition on the traditional or Aristotelian interpretation asserts the following. For the affirmative, all members of the subject class, and there is at least one such member, are members of the predicate class. For the negative, no members of the subject class, and there is at least one such member, are members of the predicate class. Our shorthand for each is all SRP and no SRP. Here are diagrams, one for the universal affirmative and the second on the bottom for the universal negative. Remember, shading represents emptiness. In other words, for the universal affirmative, the area of S outside of P is shaded, which represents nothing or no there there. So when we say all S or P, whatever S's there may be, and we assume there is one at least, are in the P class. So the shading is not available for us to put anything into, or the shading represents that the area shaded is not available for us to diagram. Similarly, we look down below at the universal negative, the area of overlap is shaded. That means that you can't put anything there. The S and P classes are mutually exclusive of each other. Also, as a reminder, the circled red X tells us that we assume at least one member of the subject class. Now, I hope you can see when you think back to what the universal affirmative and universal negative look like, that when we look at the Venn diagram for the particular affirmative and the particular negative, we see the former, the universal, entails or already diagrams its corresponding particular. So when the universal affirmative is true, the corresponding particular is true. The same goes for the universal negative. Let's take a look at the relevant parts of the square of opposition. In the upper left-hand corner, we have the universal affirmative. The lower left-hand corner, the particular affirmative. The upper right-hand corner, the universal negative and the lower right hand corner the particular negative. The Venn diagram for a true universal affirmative yields the Venn di or sorry I should rephrase that the Venn diagram shows us that uh, it gives us a picture of the logical structure of the true universal which yields 
the true particular. Same with the universal negative. So what we have when we've got subalternation is the notion of truth flowing downward. We infer a particular from its corresponding universal when that universal is true. We may not go in the reverse direction. In other words, we may not infer a true universal from a true particular, as the example on the bottom of the screen reveals. It's true that some dogs are beagles, but it's false that all dogs are beagles. We cannot legitimately infer the universal from the particular, and that applies not just to the affirmative, but also the negative. In addition, as a reminder, the elements of the square of opposition upon which we're focusing in this video are not going to be inferences that we can make on the modern interpretation of the universal. Why? Because the modern interpretation does not assume existential import. Here are some ordinary language examples. Take a look at each of them before you move on. Notice that when the universal is true, the particular of the corresponding quality is also true. Next, we want to know about what we can infer from a particular to a corresponding universal. This inference is called superalternation. That is, when we infer from a particular a corresponding universal. Once again, this inference is valid only on the mo or sorry, only on the traditional or Aristotelian interpretation. Moreover, it is only when the particular claim is false that its corresponding universal is necessarily also false. So, if it is false that at least one S is a P, then it must be false that all S are P. Similarly, if it is false that at least one S is not P, it is false that no S are P. Here again, we have the universal affirmative in the upper left corner, the particular affirmative in the lower left corner, the universal, affirm or the universal negative in the upper right corner, and the, and the particular negative in the lower right corner. Notice also that a false particular is diagrammed according to its true contradictory. In other words, when we say it is false that at least one S is P, that is, when we say it's false that some S are P, we will not have an X in the area of overlap between S and P. Instead, that area is shaded to show us that it's not the case that there is at least one S that's a P. Similarly, if we move over to the particular negative, if we say some S are not P is false, we're saying that it's not the case that there is even one S that is outside of P. So when we're talking about a false particular, we're talking also about a contradictory. In other words, the contradictory of the uh, false particular affirmative is a true E proposition. The particular negatives contradictory is a true A. Meanwhile, let's go back to super alternation. Notice that when some SRP is false, the universal affirmative, all SRP, is also false. In other words, to say all SRP is false is to say that it's not the case that there is even one S that is within the P, or the, sorry, the SP overlap. It's also the case when we show that the, by way of a Venn diagram, that the particular affirmative or particular negative is false, we see also that the universal negative is false. Some ordinary language examples will help. But first, remember, 
falsity flows upward from sub to corresponding super all term, but we cannot infer a false particular from a false universal. In other words, we cannot uh, infer a false sub altern from a super altern or from a false universal. An example will help. No dogs are pit bulls, therefore some dogs are not pit bulls. It's false that no dogs are pit bulls, but it's true that some dogs are not pit bulls. So we cannot say that the false universal entails or necessitates a false particular. In addition, as a reminder, like subalternation, superalternation is not valid on the modern interpretation. All right, let's look at some ordinary language examples before we finish off. Read through these examples and then think about how you can diagram each of the relations so that you can see how a false particular yields a false corresponding universal. I hope this tutorial on sub and superalternation helps you better understand what it means to move around the square of opposition in terms of inferences from a universal to its corresponding particular and from a particular to its corresponding universal.